I'm going to start this lesson by saying that this is a requested lesson. Uh, Don requested this lesson, and it's it's really uh, going to take a, a bit more than maybe one lesson. But the the question is why I'm a Christian. Don and some of you, most of you, I dare say, don't know why I'm a Christian. Now, I could be like Rick and just have the last name. But being a Christian is more than just being someone with the last name of Christian, right, Rick? Being a Christian is being a child of God. I was not raised in the church. My parents were of two very different denominations. And so to become a child of God was not necessarily an easy path for me to choose. So I guess in that, the reason that I'm a Christian is a unique perspective. I'm going to try to follow the PowerPoint, but this is a very personal lesson. It's a very personal story. The real reason why I'm a Christian today, the Apostle Paul summed it up in the book of Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, I would like for you to read with me what Paul wrote in verse 19 and 20. Now I didn't, before I became a Christian, I really gave this passage little consideration. But as I was thinking about this lesson this week, I realized that it really does truly sum up why I chose to follow Jesus. In Romans chapter 1 and in verse 19, the Apostle Paul says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Okay, in other words, what Paul is saying is, we know about God, it's very clear what we know about God. Look at what he says in verse 20. For his invisible attributes, okay, so the invisible things of God, what is not clearly seen about God, is shown to, is, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. What Paul is saying is, throughout the history of the world, and this has been true, throughout the history of the world, mankind has been able to see evidence of a creator. Every civilization the world has ever known that has existed since the beginning of the world has realized and recognized the evidence for a creator. There is no possibility, and this is where my mind went at a very early age. Both of my parents believed in God and they taught me about God. For that I am thankful. But I realized from a very early age, I'm not, I'm not a necessarily the most intelligent person, but I realized from a very early age that this world and all that we know is not an accident. It cannot possibly be an accident. So that's where I was from probably the time I began to learn to read. I realized that there was a system in the world. There were, are many systems, in fact, that work as a system. And with every system, there is a design. And with every design, there is a designer. With every pattern, there is an architect. And so to me, it's evident that the world 
has a creator. And that's essentially what Paul is saying. When we went out west when I was very young, my dad's brother lives in Utah. One of the places we visited, among many others, was the East Desert in eastern Utah. One of the number one places for finding fossils. You know I love rocks. I love fossils. I, I don't remember how old I was. I was probably maybe 10 years old, maybe nine. So nine or 10 years old, and I'm in the East Desert, and we are, we're hunting for dinosaur bones, Dylan. It was a lot of fun, okay? Now I've got dinosaur bones at home, and I took one to a, uh, to, to a, um, uh, a geologist. And to find out what it was, and uh, Dr. Stone was his name, of all things. Um, and Dr. Stone at Marietta College, who's passed away now, looked at it and he said, well, you know what you have here? I said, no, that's why I'm asking. And he said, you have the fingernail of a Trianosaurus rex. Okay, so at home, we have a fingernail somewhere. It's buried in years of debris and collections. But somewhere at home, my mother still has the fingernail of a Trianosaurus Rex. Now, there was an observation that I made at the age of about 10. As we were in the East Desert of Utah picking up dinosaur bones, I realized that most of the bones of those great dinosaurs were on high places, or they were in, mixed in with flood debris. Most of the dinosaur bones that we have today that have survived as fossils can be found in flood debris. Now, in my 10-year-old mind, 9 or 10-year-old mind, I realized that this was evidence of what we call Noah's Flood. Maybe that's accurate, maybe it's not. But in my mind, it was verification for what the Bible taught. Outside of that, I've looked at other religions. I've looked at and briefly studied some very strange religions in my life, in my quest. Because while I could see that the world was created and had a design, that does not mean that Christianity is the only religion. It does not mean that Christianity is right and Islam is wrong. And so I did, during my teenage years, in my quest for seeking truth, I briefly studied, and I didn't spend a lot of time on Buddhism or Hinduism. Those are just crazy religions that made absolutely no sense to me, okay? And I could not wrap my mind around the beginning of those, those religions. Uh, Islam, the Muslim faith, had a little bit more, if you will, substance to it. But a brief look at the history of Islam and a brief look at the doctrines of Islam pretty soon convinced me that it also was a false religion. And these religions existed in order to hold together the fabrics of certain societies. I discovered again, Christianity was the only one that actually made sense. Like I say, dinosaur bones, flood debris, if you, go, if you go north on the interstate, north on Interstate 77, 
uh, between exit 16 and exit 25, I think it is, between Maxburg and Caldwell. I went up there with Dr. Stone, who, by the way, is an atheist, was an atheist. And in a road cut <clears throat> in what we know of as Dudley, Ohio, is a fossil dig. Along the western bank of the interstate, where a county road runs parallel to the interstate, there is a, 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 a road cut. It's now pretty much grown over with grass and weeds and debris. But when I was in high school, that road cut was cut through shale. And in that shale, there were little fossils, most of them smaller than my little fingernail. But we dug buckets of fossils, and there are still buckets of fossils. So if you ever want to go visit that, I'll be happy to take you up, and we can go dig fossils. But the thing about that particular dig is that all of those fossils are sea creatures. Seashells, sea snails. And there's, set, there's some other smaller ones whose names I have forgotten. But all of them are sea-dwelling creatures. Mind you, I don't remember how many hundreds of feet we are above sea level here. But we're well above sea level. And Dr. Stone is trying to explain how all of this region of Ohio was, the, was an ocean floor at one time. Now, the same, the same shale formation goes underground from that point, and somewhere behind Newport, Ohio, comes up again. Now, I've not been there, but Dr. Stone assured us that somewhere behind Newport, that same shale formation resurfaces and comes above ground again. And there's a fossil dig there with the same sea creatures. Okay, again, my mind goes back to what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1. The evidence, because that's what I was weighing as a child. Is what the Bible teaches true or is it false? If it's false, <coughs> where, where? is the truth. For me, it was about weighing the facts and the evidence. And I came to the conclusion there was a creator. And I came to the conclusion that the Bible taught the only logical answer. And I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to swallow what I swallowed necessarily. But in studying other religions, I realized there was a vast difference in Christianity. And here are some things that drew me to the Christian faith. Now, I could have chosen to become an atheist, but I'll tell you, my faith was not that strong. To, to think that all of this is accidental is ridiculous. So therefore, it must be created by something or someone. And if it's created by the God of the Bible, then each one of us has a responsibility to read about this God of the Bible and to study him. At least that's where my mind was. I guess I never thought of myself as one of those people that ask why all the time. But the older I get, the more I realize that was how I got the answers. Let me tell you some things that drew me to Christianity, though, aside from the facts and the evidence. Christianity is about love. If there's one thing Jesus offers... It's love. This is Jesus of the Bible. 
I want you to think about this. I've got several passages I want us to turn to. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, down in verse 14. See what Paul writes about here. Paul says, Let all that you do be done in love. I want you to think about this. If we take this into our lives, into the world, I want you to think about the world-changing effect that this could have today. This had a world-changing effect on my life. Look at 1 John. John probably writes more than anyone else about love. But look, look at 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 8. It's a hallmark of Christianity. This is why I'm a Christian. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Love is embodied in God. And also back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We look at this chapter, and this chapter tells us more of the characteristics of love than anywhere else. Paul is explaining in detail Christian love. The world does not comprehend this. The world confuses love with tolerance. There's a difference. The world confuses love with lust. There's a difference. The Apostle Paul describes Christian love in chapter 13, the entire chapter, really. But I, I want you to notice some of the characteristics. Begin with me in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been known, fully known. Now I want you to notice the, the very last verse. Paul says, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. The greatest is love. You ever wonder why the greatest is love? The greatest is love because love is the only one that we will carry with us into eternity. When heaven comes, we won't need faith. When we're experiencing the joy of being with Jesus in heaven, we won't need to hope for it anymore. It will be a reality. So faith and hope end with death. They end when eternity begins. But love transcends eternity. Christianity is about hope. It's hope that gets me up in the mornings. When I don't have hope, I don't have motivation. Someone one time said that you cannot be a pessimist and be a Christian. I believe that. We cannot be a pessimist and be a Christian. We cannot be depressed and be a Christian. 
because Paul says hope is going to last. I want to go back into the Old Testament for a moment. The book of Jeremiah. Oh, if there was ever a man, Jeremiah is often referred to as the weeping prophet because he was so upset about the injustices of the society in which he lived. He was so upset and concerned about the judgment of God that he wept. But in Jeremiah chapter 29 and in verse 11, Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Did you know that? God has plans for you. God had plans for me. I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. Some of your translations will say for good and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you shall seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations and place in all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, in the context, Jeremiah is writing this as God is speaking to the Israelite people. But, here's what we sometimes maybe need to do. I want you to think of this as you read it as if God is speaking to you personally. Because He is. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning so that we through patience of the Scriptures might have hope. We go back a little bit farther into the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah talks about hope. Again, Isaiah is prophesying of doom and gloom. But with every prophecy of destruction, of every prophecy of discipline, there comes the prophecy of hope and restoration. The Bible is built on hope. The Bible is built on restoration. Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 31. Isaiah says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Now, these are passages that I did not necessarily know all existed. These are passages that I have discovered in my walk with Christ. These are passages that uh, as I was seeking truth, gave me the encouragement to solidify my faith. They gave me the encouragement that I needed in order to actually become a child of God. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 6, here the Apostle Paul says, and I am sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You should think about that. Everyone here this morning, you're here. You're here, kids, because God has begun a good work in you. You're at the beginning. I have confidence that God began a good work in you and he is going to complete that good work in your lives. I promise you he will. Here's another aspect about Christianity. Christianity is about forgiveness. It's about forgiving others, but for me, more importantly, it was about realizing that all of the evil things and I was just like anybody else. 
I was just like every other teenager. I did things that were wrong. I did things that I regret. Christianity was about forgiveness. Realizing that the evil things that I had done were just as if they no longer existed. We'll look at a few passages. I may cut some of these short because of time's sake. So I'm going to go to Ephesians. In Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians, Paul writes about forgiveness in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 31. <clears throat> Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger <clears throat> and clamor and slander be put away from among you with all malice. Be kind one, be kind one to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And over in Romans chapter six. So this is interaction with our fellow uh, human beings, specifically our fellow Christians. But over in Romans chapter six. And in verse 5, the whole sixth chapter of the book of Romans is the new beginning. The new beginning for a Christian, what it means to be, to start fresh. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, Paul says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. It's about a new beginning. Forgiveness. It's about eternity. We have all experienced death. Every one of us has experienced the death of someone close to us. The Hebrew writer says it is appointed unto man once to die. It's an appointment that like it or hate it. One of these days we will personally experience. Christianity offers us hope after death. And if the Bible is correct, and if nature is correct, if there is a creator of the world, and that creator of the world matches the God of the Bible, then we have hope of eternity. We have hope of life after death. Now, when I was a teenager, this really didn't appeal a whole lot to me. I didn't think that. You know, when you're a teenager, you're pretty much invincible. When you're a young person, you don't think about death. Although I have to say, I went to a lot of funerals. My grandfather was one of 13 children. And over the years, I've been to Almost, I think I think we've got two left out of thirteen. And I went to I went to all their funerals. I went to all their spouses' funerals. I went to funerals for my mom's cousins. I went to funerals for my dad's aunts and uncles as well, and my dad's cousins. Death is a part of life. But the Bible offers us, while we're in Romans chapter six. Let's think about what the Bible offers us. Not only does it offer us, not only does Christianity offer us the forgiveness of our imperfections, the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of our wrongs, not only does it offer that and a new start, but in verse 12, that new start 
doesn't just lead to a better physical life. That new start leads to eternal life. Paul says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members <clears throat> to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, turn with me to Revelations. One of the greatest depictions in, Re in the book of Revelations, I think, is found in Revelation chapter 21. The very end of this book is a passage that should give us all encouragement Revelation 21, and in verse 1, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, <clears throat> and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away. And this, this is what has got me for years, is verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. I knew all these things. I knew that Christianity offered all of that. But I also felt that Christianity was a lifelong commitment. It's not something that I was willing to jump into. For years, I worked for a preacher by the name of Keith Malone. And Keith and I constantly, every day, we constantly had religious discussions. I wanted to know more about Christianity. I wanted to know the ins and the outs. One time we were at a congregation that no longer exists in Do called Dottery Street, Charleston, West Virginia. Keith Malone held a meeting there. And I asked on the way down, I said, do they have a baptistry down here? He said, uh, I believe so. You want to make use of it? I said, no, not yet. I thought about that. My hesitation was I knew it was a lifelong commitment. And I knew that my family would not agree with me. And to this day, most of them still don't. But I also knew that as sure as the Bible teaches about heaven, Revelation chapter 20 teaches about hell. And I knew that I could not have, I could not believe the Bible and believe in heaven and not believe in hell. And I had what some would refer to a come to Jesus moment. Now, this experience was not a saving experience. This experience was a turning point in my life. Salvation's a process, and it begins differently for everyone. When you decide to follow Jesus, it begins at a different point for you than it probably did for me. But here was my turning point. For me, it had, it, it had to do with parents who believed in God, who were willing to teach me Bible. Paul in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That was the beginning. Now, I knew I needed Jesus in my life. I also knew that my parents 
were not on par exactly with the Bible. One day, while I was working for Keith Malone, we were on the west side of Marietta, Harbor Hill. There is a beautiful house. You go up Maple Street Extension. It's the corner of Maple Street and High Street. It's a beautiful house. Cream color, white trim. Two main stories, an attic that is big. Our job was to restore the concealed gutter system 40 feet above the ground. Okay? 40 feet above the ground. By the way, this house was owned by uh, relatives of Buffalo Bill Cody. Okay? So if, you, if you're familiar with who Buffalo Bill Cody was, it belonged to, I believe, his aunt and uncle. And so we were up on this house, and I was above a porch, and I put the ladder on the porch up against the roof of the house above the porch, and I'm in a corner. It's morning. You know what happens to metal roofs when the dew is on them? They get slippery, Okay. My ladder's on the metal roof. And there's dew dripping down and off the leaves of the trees. And I'm working in the corner on the ladder. All of a sudden, that ladder goes out from under me. Now, I'm scared of heights. So this was extra terrifying. Mr. Malone knew that I was scared of heights, by the way. And he enjoyed putting me in places that made me uncomfortable. I am here hanging between two pieces of downspout by my elbows. That's the only thing. I've got, a, I've got an arm on each side of that downspout, and I'm hanging there. The ladder is way below me, uh, and I knew that if I fell, I'd hit the porch roof and roll off of the porch roof onto the stone sidewalk below. Now, I wasn't ready for that much pain. But what I really wasn't ready for was ready to die. That was the first what I would consider near-death experience that I ever had in my life. I knew what the Bible said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned, depending on your translation. So I knew that heaven was real. I believed that. I also knew that hell was real. And I knew, if I wasn't a Christian, I knew where my destination was going to be. Fear is a great motivator. I also knew that 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says, The like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. And I knew what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. I knew all those things. I was 22 years old. And as I'm hanging there from the gutter, I managed to get my brand new cell phone out of my pocket. Mr. Malone had bought me a brand new flip phone. You had to pull the antenna out. If it had been in my pants pocket, I couldn't have done it. And I'm, I'm hanging there. I know the Bible says that the prayers of a sinful man are never heard, but I was praying for strength. And I reached over while my elbows were on that gutter, and I pulled out that cell phone and held it up to my teeth, and I pulled the antenna out with my teeth. Flipped that thing open and called Keith Malone, who was working on the other side of the house. And he answered the phone, what are you calling me for? I'm just on the other side of the house. I said, I got a problem here. Needless to say, I didn't fall. I'm here today. That was a turning point in my, I believed, but I was unwilling to commit. I knew that if I fell, I would not be where I wanted to be. I would be with those 
who are lost. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 while we're here. Oh yeah, Revelation 21 carries a great amount of encouragement, things about heaven. But if we back up to verse 8, but as for the cowardly, your King James Version will say fearful. Friends, that's exactly what I was. I was looking for the approval of my parents. I didn't want to disappoint my parents. I was afraid to disappoint my parents. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, you don't have enough faith to act on what you believe in, then you don't have faith at all. The detestable, the murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars will have their portion at the lake, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's eternal hell. I was afraid that's where I was headed. For me, Christianity is not that I'm perfect. Never have been, never will be. I'm not even that great of a person. Ask my wife. She'll tell you the truth. But you know what? We call it a walk. We call it a walk. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, We walk by faith and not by sight. The Hebrew writer says that we run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go hiking, I don't look for the sign that says end of trail. I never start at the end of the trail. We never start at the end of a race. We start at the beginning. We start at the beginning. And you don't have to be perfect. And you don't have to be good. It is a process in which we grow. Every step forward we take is a step closer to perfection. Closer to winning the race. For me, it's having confidence. That confidence that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if the tent of our earthly home, he's talking about our physical body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <clears throat> It's about having that confidence. Now, I've had a couple of other near-death experiences since that day on Harbor Hill. I wasn't afraid. Because I had confidence. For me, it's about moving forward and getting better. The final verse that I want us to look at this morning is found in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippian Christians in Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 13 and 14, Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. I'm not there yet. If Paul wasn't there yet, neither am I. Paul says, But, the, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Christianity is about being better tomorrow than we are today. It's about being better today than we were yesterday. It's about progress and moving forward. That's how I became a child of God. I became a child of God because I looked at the evidence, I evaluated the facts, and realized that there was a creator, and that that creator matched up to the one the Bible talks about. 
And I realized if there was a creator in the Bible, then the Bible had to contain something important. And I realized that it told me of heaven, it told me of hell, it gave me hope, it gave me confidence. But it also gave me fear and motivation. If you're here this morning, not a child of God, I would encourage you to think on these things, and if we can help you in any way, we will do so, as together we stand and as we sing.